Uh, my name is Joe Spadola. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the Bill of Materials uh, in Design Life. Just at a show of hands, how many people currently use the Bill of Materials? How many people have? One. We've got one. Okay. Th have you heard of the Bill of Materials within the context of Design Life? All right. This will be good. <coughs> <laughs> I can say anything. <laughs> um, Okay, so I guess my first bullet point here is uh, especially valid then. Um, we're going to ask the question what it is and, and why, uh, why I would use it or why you would use it. Um, <coughs> then we'll say uh, address why it works or how it works. Uh, and once we establish that, uh, that it does work and that is quite handy, we're going to ask if there's anything else we can do with it. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'll do a quick demo so that you can see an action, uh, which, which is probably a good idea because it sounds like not many people have. <coughs> uh, okay, so perhaps this should actually be a training, but it's not. Um, I want everyone here to just walk away with a conceptual understanding of the Bill of Materials. Um, I'm going to click around in a couple things, but understand that uh, I'm not going to show you every mouse click, every button, every option that has to be set in order to, to, to enable this. Uh, but to just have a conceptual understanding of, of what it is and how you can use it. <coughs> um, okay, so depending on who you are within your company, uh, the bill of materials uh, could mean a, a lot of different things. Uh, within the context of design life, um, it means a, uh, essentially it's a list of useful material related information. Um, <coughs> and you would use it anytime you want to carry along that information throughout the analysis. So that could be things like material names. Okay, and we'll see in a second that we can actually use this, this idea of the bill of materials to um, have Design Life automatically assign material names uh, based on this list that I give it. Okay? Um, what other kind of useful information uh, might be handy to carry along through analysis? Uh, perhaps something like uh, a part or an assembly name. If you're dealing with very large models, um, it could be useful. If, if you think about the end result of fatigue analysis, <coughs> one of the things that you usually see at the end of that is a tabular listing of uh, your nodes and then the associated damages. So having a part name or a part ID or an assembly ID come along for the ride uh, so that you can very easily associate what part, say, uh, is at that particular node, um, you, can, uh, you can see that. <coughs> you can also include other things like um, uh, cost of redesign, say, for a particular uh, part. If, uh, if for whatever reason you are um, uh, below your desired fatigue life, uh, you can quickly assess uh, based on, I don't know if somebody entered that into the, to the, uh, the bill of materials, how much it would cost to redesign that particular part. You can see that uh, very easily. Uh, as well as whether or not you can redes uh, redesign that part in the first place. Okay, so any sort of design constraints that you might run into, um, you can uh, quickly and easily uh, see and associate with your most damaged nodes. <coughs> um, okay, so how does it work? Well, essentially, uh, you take all this useful information here. Uh, nine, times uh, nine times out of ten, you'll go into Excel. You'll create this pretty list. Uh, and then you'll save it out as a, as a CSV file, okay? And then you go into Design Life, you open up your, uh, uh, your analysis glyph and you enable the Bill of Materials input, okay? And that just comes in as multi-column input. And so you feed that in to your analysis like, uh, like that and, uh, and you're good to go. <coughs> okay, so uh, it looks a little something like this. If you go uh, investigate and, and actually hook up a data values display uh, to that multi-column input, uh, you, you might see something like this. Uh, so in the first row here, you have a list of all the, in this case, we're looking at the, in the material group that is present in your uh, model. So here we've got all the, apparently a bunch of shells, shells 100 all the way through uh, 120. <coughs> we have also included the associated material for that particular uh, material group. Okay, so Design Life is actually going to go assign this particular material from the database to that particular material group. Okay, uh, and then 
coming along for the ride, we have the assembly ID, part ID, uh, thickness of the part, okay, if, that's, if that's of interest. So, I mean, you can literally have anything uh, that you want come along uh, for the ride here. <coughs> Once your analysis is done, um, and you go look at the tabular results over here at the end, you can see, so here's the typical sort of table you'd expect to see at the end of your, anal uh, your analysis. Uh, you've got your nodes over on the left, uh, and then here you see the material groups as well as all that other information uh, that I asked it to carry through the analysis. So now I can quickly see here, um, I've got a very short life here of seven repeats about seven repeats on, uh, on node 31017. Uh, so you can either go uh, pop up your, your display here and look for that node or query it, uh, or you can just very quickly look over and see that this is from part, uh, part 102, and uh, that might mean something to, uh, to you uh, if, if this was your particular analysis. So you'd know exactly on what part this, uh, this low life uh, can be seen. <coughs> so, I've said already uh, that, well, there's a couple things we can do with this. First of all, if you're going from CSV, if you're going from Excel to a CSV, uh, the first way to make this easier is to just forget the whole CSV step in general and just keep it as an XLS uh, spreadsheet, okay? This way, uh, anybody in your organization who is going to be updating your bill of materials uh, can do so. So obviously you're going to have engineers updating material names, uh, designers updating part assembly names, uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know, supply chain people or someone updating cost of redesign. All this stuff comes together uh, into one sheet that's, that's easily edited uh, and saved, and then it feeds right into your, uh, your analysis. <coughs> okay, so the second thing that, uh, that we can do is we've already learned uh, that Design Life is going to take this particular material that I have listed on the left and go look through my materials database and assign that material to this material group. Okay, so uh, in this case, you can see I have a handful of different materials in here. So anything that uh, is listed in this, uh, any material group that has this material is going to get that. So that's kind of useful. Uh, over here, I've got a bunch of information just coming along for the ride, but it would be nice if there's other information that assign life could that assign life that design life could assign for me as well. So if I were to expand this table a little bit and think of some other things that I want to um, assign as well, um, you can think of scale factor. If there are uh, scale factors you need to apply to certain uh, to the loads on certain elements. Uh, or K user, if you have a user to find a surface correction factor, uh, or, or a K treatment or a surface roughness. Okay? You can drive all of these properties through this material, uh, or through this Excel sheet right here, just by feeding it to your analysis glyph. Okay? So it becomes quite useful and quite uh, a time saver as well. <coughs> what you will ultimately find is that if you go look at your material mapper here, uh, for any given element, here I'm looking at the shell intents, you can pretty much drive any property that you find in this list here uh, from that Excel sheet. Okay, so at the beginning of your analysis, uh, you might see something like this, uh, where it's just got you know, all the default values, you haven't added anything to it, you haven't modified anything. <coughs> and then you have that Excel sheet, you feed it into your bill of materials input, run the analysis, and at the end, you will see for that given <coughs> uh, material, uh, material group, Design Life will find everything in that row and uh, feed it into this material mapper here. So you can see now I've got that, uh, uh, that material name up in here. I've got the scale factor there. I've got a new surface roughness type, K user, K treatment, et cetera. Okay, so all these properties have been input for me uh, automatically. So if I go here, I guess this is just uh, reiterating this fact. Uh, if I go look at the uh, original Excel sheet that I had and look at one particular element, here we have the shell 110s highlighted. <coughs> if I 
follow this row all the way across, I will see that all these, uh, all these properties here have been filled into my analysis. Okay, and this was, this was completely automated. All I did was set up this, this Excel sheet, input it as, uh, uh, as a bill of materials input to my analysis glyph, and this was done uh, automatically for me. Okay, so it becomes a pretty uh, convenient way to, to get all this information in there. Uh, I mean, especially, you imagine, um, you know, in your analysis, opening up the material mapper every single time if you wanted to change uh, one scale factor value or, say, one K treatment factor for all of your elements. Um, you can uh, keep do that really easily right here and keep track of it uh, quite easily as well. Um, okay, so very briefly show you what that looks like. So first of all, let's take a look at the uh, this bill of materials that I had. Okay, so here it is. Very nice, pretty uh, Excel. Okay, everyone loves Excel. <coughs> so here's my list of uh, uh, material groups. Here's the materials. You can go in here, edit anything, change anything you want. Uh, at this point, all you have to do is, uh, is save it. Uh, and as soon as you do that, here, let's go look at our inputs. We've got uh, our bomb. So I'm going to drop the just the, the raw XLF file, the Excel file, right into the Excel input. Okay. Uh, this, I don't know how many people here actually uh, use Excel files as, as input, but it's really easy to get data straight out of an Excel file into your analysis. Uh, and this is, a, this is an example of that. Uh, I'm going to drop in some time series loads here and, a, uh, and an FE model. <coughs> okay, so at this point, all I have to do, run the flow, uh, and then we're going to look at two things. The first is, like I said earlier, that raw data from, uh, from Excel input. Okay, so there's just a multi-column output from that Excel file. You can see here, here are all those values uh, that, uh, that I entered in the Excel sheet. Okay. <coughs> uh, at the end, the tabular results. So this is just write out the, uh, the, the compressed results from your, uh, your, your analysis here. Now you can see this complete listing of, uh, of everything that, that, uh, that you had in there as well. Okay, so here's the part ID thickness, uh, redesign constraint, all the, all the others as well. So you can very quickly see, okay, I'm actually seeing some static failure on, uh, on this particular part right there. Okay. So very easy way to associate um, the most damaged areas of your model with other information that you uh, might want to carry through your analysis. <coughs> uh, and you can very easily, I'm, I'm not going to show an example of it, but with the Excel file that we had open, you can just add another row and add something in, say, um, say a database name. If you have materials from different databases, okay, you can actually point to different databases and have those materials uh, applied to different parts of the model uh, very, uh, very easily. Okay, so to, to summarize that, um, bill of materials is a very useful way to carry this information uh, that you define on the onset throughout the rest of your analysis. Um, and then secondly, you can actually uh, push that a step farther and, and, and use that bill of materials to actually drive uh, some of those property values that are in the material mapper. And the, the most useful cases of this are probably um, applying like the surface treatments to these nodes uh, and, per, and perhaps pointing to uh, different databases so that you can get materials from different databases into the, into the, same, uh, the same analysis. Okay? Questions? 